welcome to what is going to be an amazing presentation about self-motivation and confidence in our children. My name is Andy Hare. I'm an educator from Geelong, Australia. About, if you're trying to work out where Geelong is, I'm about an hour south of Melbourne. Now I'm here in great state of Victoria. Um, this presentation moving forward is going to be some tips and tricks for you guys, but also maybe a little bit of affirmation because it's probably something you're already doing, but we're going to look at the science of why we do it and certainly from my mentors as well and, and why they're my mentors and the things I've learned from them. Um, I teach at a school called Leopold Primary School. It is a prep to grade six, so a kindergarten to grade six school, and I'm teaching values education and physical education there. So we're, we're teaching the students to become unbelievable citizens of Leopold um, and the greater city of Geelong, but then also being able to use their physical skills to become very physically literate in our city. So sit back, enjoy, get that pen and paper ready, and if you like, a nice cup of coffee. Ready? Here we go. So a big thank you to Human Kinetics for inviting me to become a part of this virtual health and PE conference for 2021. We are living in a virtual world right now and to have the opportunity to advocate for physical education and health is so rich and so important for us to still deliver the why we do what we do um, in our little settings so then you as the delegate to this conference can do what you love to do as well and take a few little tricks along the way. I know that uh, Human Kinetics, I've been a big fan of um, of their resources for so many years. Um, you know, this, I'm in my 26th year of teaching now and I think that, you know, that name has resonated with me for well and truly two decades. Um, with some of the textbooks and um, and guides along the way. Um, I also know that this conference uh, couldn't go on without the wonderful people behind the scenes. So you know who you are. Um, hopefully we'll meet it one day in person, but I want to say thank you so much for giving your time to the PE community. Team, this presentation is called Engaging Your Students into Lifelong Love Affair with Physical Activity and Self-Care. It will represent everything that I want my students to be, and this is going to be my story. First and foremost, I come from a, a land and a country called Wotherong. So here um, in my area, we we pay our respects to the traditional owners. So this is a little passage that uh, precedes any presentation that I do. Um, I acknowledge the tradition. Sorry, I'm going to start that one again. Um, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and respectfully pay my respect to the elders past and present and emerging. Today, I present to you from Wadarong country. So this is our indigenous country where we take great pride in recognizing the first inhabitants of this area. Um, and certainly something that I'm very passionate with about as well in ensuring that my students know the games and the movements of the First Nation people, the Wadarong um, tribe there in the region of Leopold. We have a big lake. Um, called Connawari. Now, Connawari is an indigenous word for black swan. And the the lake um, is only a kilometre from the school, um, but it is so significant in the area as well um, of the Wadarong tribe. Um, so, you know, they are a big part of this story um, as we are as um, consumers of physical education and educators and we have to know that we are the custodians of this information currently. We're going to pass this on just like we've received that information from our Wadarong elders. This presentation is broken up in three different sections, the why, what, how. And I'm going to go through each step because as a, an educator, you also need to understand that this is not just about another 10 great activities that you can put into your classroom. Um, it's about understanding where they've come from and what this particular design can actually do for your programs, but also your school. If you are 
entrenched in leadership and you have a great mate up there, um, then this, this information is great to pass on to them because we may see the students only once a week, but our classroom teachers are there and looking after the kids for the majority of it. If they can advocate for this as well, then we're going to see a much richer movement lifestyle from all our students. Um, so the first part is all about the research and the science. And there's four figureheads, four mentors to hear that I must um, pay gratitude to. They have really shaped who I am. Um, and then certainly moving forward uh, in this presentation, you're going to see bits and pieces of all these four. Um, the first one, top left, is Paul Zentarski. And um, Paul is my inspiration and science mentor. So um, Paul and I met um, on Twitter many, many years ago, but met in person at the California State Conference there back in 2019. So such an honor to have Paul on, on this sheet as a mentor. Top right, uh, we've got Mike Cooksala. So Mike is my program implementation mentor. So um, I take a lot of inspiration from how to put things together from Mike and certainly the, the science behind it, but also the reasons behind it as well. And like Paul, I met Mike over in California that same year. It was such an honor to, to be able to have breakfast with them, but um, see them in person and then just be so thrilled that they came to my sessions as well. Bottom left, um, Bernie Holland, and Bernie is based here in Melbourne. And Bernie is my physical literacy mentor, so um, probably also one of the, the greatest um, minds in physical education. And um, not only do we talk physical literacy, but we actually discuss everything education. And, and really, Bernie is one person that I love to bounce ideas off and get that critical feedback from as well. Um, and then bottom right, we have Mark Collard, and Mark Collard is the owner of Playmio, uh, which is an un incredible website. And you're going to see big chunks of that through here. Um, and he's an activities inspiration for me, not only teaching me about um, great activities, but why those activities are super important at critical times. Um, all right, let's dive straight into some science. So from Atchford, Victoria, these four statements are critical in understanding that Healthier students equal better learners. Um, that 90 minutes of a week of specialised PE will increase numeracy and writing skills. 83% of students who receive mostly A's at school are more likely to be active than students who receive D's and F's. And we'll dive into that a little bit later as well. And movement into class time improves on task and decreases off task um, and definitely increases and improves academic achievement. This picture here was instrumental in my wanting to connect with Paul Zentarski. And what this does is this shows two pictures here. One on the left is at the brain after sitting quietly. It's cooling down, um, and then we're looking at the brain after walking for only 20 minutes, and you can see that it's starting to fire. What I took from this one picture is, firstly, the understanding of how I learn. If I can't understand how I learn, I'm not going to be able to understand how my students learn. Um, and I know in the introduction, you probably saw right behind me, um, the wall of running numbers. And I, I love to be active, but I love to be active and then be creative straight afterwards. And it's because my brain is at the most active. Um, so I'm trying to replicate that same idea with my students and also that idea of pushing that knowledge forward to the classroom teacher. Everything we do, we have to push forward to the classroom teacher. I know in our schools that classroom teacher, you might get negative feedback from them. Um, you might seem as a bit of a pest to them, but don't give up. Uh, I can tell you now, for 26 years, I've been pushing this idea of active classrooms. And even though I know that somewhere one person might be doing it, 
my belief is that everyone is doing it. And if I give up on that belief, then I won't be creative in providing for the students I teach as well. Um, we know that the brain benefits of exercise, it increases the production of neurochemicals. It improves memory. It lengthens attention span. It boosts decision-making skills. It prompts growth of new nerve cells and blood vessels, and it improves multitasking and planning. You, as an educator, know this because this is you. This is representative of you. And then we also have the health benefits that come with physical exercise. And it's all to do with the physical literacy outcomes, believe it or not. Um, these slides are available on this presentation anyway, so I won't go through that in great detail, but definitely check that out because you'll be ticking those boxes off if you are someone that loves to exercise. Um, I've got a couple of mottos that I, I take into physical education. This one, I believe, is the top one is out of New York, so it's the play. Um, promoting lifelong activity for youth. It's an organization over there, but I just love that ideal of play. Um, quite often, we'll talk about that at conferences, just let the kids play. Um, well, it's a little bit more than that. It's promoting that lifelong activity for youth, you know, um, and goes along that atmosphere. And then we have our fun with two ends. So functional understanding, not necessary. And this is a phrase that I picked up from Mark Collard, um, who I mentioned in that opening um, presentation slide. Um, our objective through all of this is trying to improve physical literacy. So my physical literacy statements in here are sourced from Sport Australia. Um, that is who we are looking at answering to and our state departments work with closely with Sport Australia to align what educators in schools are trying to do. So here we're looking for students to improve mental health and well-being, improve awareness to oneself and capabilities, improve self-esteem, self-confidence. That's what this presentation is all about develop resilience, improves academic performance, improves social skills. Again, this is what this is all about. Um, it helps build friendships. It helps children learn new skills that can be applied to other aspects of their life and develops behaviors for lifelong participation in movement and physical activity. What I love this with this is after quite a number of years of teaching, I have pinpoints of students that either come back or we see actually being active. And I know that I've had a little, just a minor part of that belief. I really love the transition between grade two and grade three students because it's the grade three students that develop um, the, oh, this is what I can do now with these skills. Whereas in grade two, they're developing the skills and my, my always go-to um, story here is to do with a wheelchair athlete called Mitchell Bond, who in grade three um, was bound to a wheelchair and with obviously um, leg deformities, and we got him into little athletics. And from there, he took off and became a state champion, a national champion, and now at the age of 23, he's vying for a scholarship in the American College Basketball um, programs as a wheelchair athlete. He will go to the Olympic Games, probably not Tokyo, but he will go to um, the next, next one. He is phenomenal. And if we didn't get him into little athletics at that point, um, who knows? I'd love to say how you know it would never have turned out. It probably would have turned out because he's that type of kid, but we contributed, uh, let's say, 0.1% um, of where he is now, and that is a win. When we look at the foundation of my students at Leopold Primary School, I want them to recognize themselves in three ways. I want them to be 100% confident with themselves. And then I want them to take themselves and see themselves in their family. I know it comes the other way around when we come to school, but we're trying to teach them this is how we exist. And that family could be a friendship group um, or at home or friends in the classroom. So we're looking at themselves 
and themselves in their family and then moving on to their family in their community. So how do I want to be? How do I want to be with my friends? How do I want my friends to act in my class um, or my class to act within my school? And looking at that whole foundation of that confidence and competence and social um, but also that psychological aspect of physical literacy as well and the outcomes that are measurable by there um, have a large factor to play in my friends in my community but also me in my friends. Um, the outcomes of this program and this design is the self-confidence, the self-belief and the physical engagement into physical activity. If we do this right, we get... 100% buy-in of personal strengths. We want to look at those academic gains. Uh, for a long time, I believe that if kids were more active, they'd become a lot smarter. Well, you know, the debate is out there with that, but I've really led to believe with my great mate, Nathan Weaver, up in Sydney, um, who did some research around it, and he said, well, here's a different spin. Um, and he looked at the, the hit for, um, training philosophy of, getting kids moving in short intervals. Uh, but what he found was they were learning the skills um, and they built self-confidence from those skills, which then translated across to the academic gains because they were able to know that they were being successful. Um, and sure, that movement aspect actually assisted, um, but on a cold brain, they were still able to maintain their self-belief, um, which was incredible so i changed tact at the start of the year and thought you know what instead of giving the kids physical workouts all the time it's developing a program in my values program that fosters self-confidence um and you know and we build it from there and, and we move forward to see exactly how this actually works it's never going to be a hundred percent buy-in for personal strength but um i have students that i know that Without under my under another teacher's care last year, um, compared to my care, they are increasing in self confidence, um, and you know it is to do with good teaching, but it's also about understanding children. And uh, you know, my best quality is that uh, I'm youthful, that I love to actually um, treat children and be childlike uh, at the same age that they're working with. So if I'm working with a 12-year-old, when we talk, I'm thinking like a 12-year-old. If I'm working with a six-year-old, when we talk, I'm thinking like a six-year-old. And then my achievement gains um, grow a lot higher because I'm reaching the level that they are at. Um, our next section is all about the what, so the design. It's just not, here's some activities, let's jump in, see what happens. It is about the design of the model. Um, and this is my physical education class design. Um, I have a walk-in activity. I'm going to explain these in a minute. I love to then review some content. I love to present some new content. Uh, I love to have a challenge one or a task one or a practice one, um, followed by a harder task two, and then looking at the new content that they've just learned and reviewing that. So we get a chance to know where we're coming from and understanding where we are going. Um, the walk-in is really important, and this is something that uh, uh, an educator down here called Sean De Morton, um, who now works for Cricket Australia, and Wayne Schultz, um, who did work for Cricket Australia and is now back teaching, and Sean was teaching and is now working for Cricket Australia. And together, we've spent a lot of time talking about walk-ins. Um, and the walk-in activity, in my view, is exactly this. Students are presented with a challenge as they walk into the learning space. It might be a throw and catch to themselves. It might, might be an obstacle course set up. There might be some rolling goals. Um, there might be a tag game, you're it. There might be um, a challenge that says how many baskets. Or there might be a game of traffic. And each one of those are just a task that's presented on a large whiteboard that they have right in the entrance way that they can't miss. Um, and they have to discover what it means. A lot will be hesitant to start because they're unsure of what it means. 
But their one rule is they're not allowed to ask the teacher. They have to use their eyes and communicate with each other. Um, and this gets the kids moving straight away. So we're going to hit them with content soon, but we are giving um, kids a chance to warm their brains up. And it's a five-minute power. Um, it's a five-minute, let's get this going and let's see how hard we can work and get our brains fired up. The music's pumping. Um, a little bit a little bit like Tony Robbins. If Tony Robbins wants a, an audience to be pumping and jumping, he's got the music pumping and jumping. If he wants them to calm down, the music will calm down. But we, we want to give the kids this activity so then there's a connection between last week's work and also um, a familiar concept that they already might know that they can become better at. After that five minutes is up, then it's a chance to actually welcome the class um, and they get their first opportunity to sit and be welcomed. Um, here, we draw on last week's lesson. Um, personally, I have to mark the role first hour of the day and last hour of the day, but through that lesson, then that's a requirement by our um, uh, school and department. But then through the lessons of the other classes through my day, I'm actually doing a rolling role where um, I like to do it while the kids are working or in that walk-in because then that gives me a chance to save time um, on the roll. And you know, any time we can save, we can actually fill it with activity, which is a brilliant idea. Um, I'm high-fiving myself right now and everyone around me as well, of course. But in this section, section, we look at the review. So draw on last week. What actually happened? What did we learn uh, from last week? Um, getting the kids to provide examples. So we don't want them to sit and put their hand up. It's like, okay, uh, Patrick, come up front. Show us what we did last week. Um, you know, Adara, can you come up the front? Can you help us out? What was your method of solving that last week? Charlotte, can you come up the front and show us? So the kids getting multiple exposures there. Um, and then we discuss areas, concerns. What, what was hard? What did we find um, difficult? And then we celebrate achievements as well. So, you know, drawing on the children that, may say lack self-confidence and then boosting them up through acknowledging that they were seen last week being unbelievable. Um, we don't like to make examples of um, students. In fact, that's a, a, a I would have it as a law uh, for my school, but you know we don't make those examples. Um, quite often, students at my school will actually offer that up themselves that, oh, yeah, I was having trouble doing this last week, but I might have seen Patrick doing it a different way. So that helped me. Immediately after the review, we go into the present the content. Um, and all these can be done in you know three-way share, um, in turn and talks and all of that stuff and then present back because that gets more kids actively involved and that goes through for the review as well you know for instance like what did we do last week turn and talk you've got 30 seconds so every single person there is is sharing um and it's the same um in this way is that we're presenting that new information to the kids what we are doing today um what do oh sorry why are we doing this and how we are going to be doing this. So the why, what, how, super, super important in our classes. Um, I don't believe that this needs to be written up. You know, I look at that and I debate this all the time, is that how many kids will read the written work around the room? Um, and my colleague and I are big on reminding kids what the why, what, how are vocally. Um, however, we have experimented with the written content a lot and the kids don't use that as a reference point. So we use it a different way. Um, and then making this stuff super simple for the kids to follow, but also using provocations. A uh, great example of provocation that I have used um, was my, my great friend um, Dick Fosbury. Um, Dick and I met over in Seattle in 2015 and ever since, whenever I do my track and field unit, um, and other units as well, I'll often send little video clips to, to Dick um, and Dick will talk back to the kids and he will give them some feedback, he'll give them some tips uh, and it's an, un, it's an incredibly powerful way of getting kids to really foster and embrace 
physical exercise, but not only that, that the track and field, you know, to, to know, okay, I'm going to do the Fosby FOP today and then know that Dick Fosby is actually a friend of Leopold Primary School is even greater because he will talk to the kids using their names and giving them feedback on some of their actions. Um, once we finish this, we get the kids straight into exploring the new content in Task 1. I use the word explore because uh, I love to see what the kids can do um, we explicitly break things down when it's required, um, but not always as a whole group. Uh, we love to rove around and just uh, work with students one-on-one, -on -one, two on two, uh, three on three at a time, rather than be explicit with a group that might have six different levels across there. So the content is needing to be challenging, but reachable, hands-on, equipment-based, the kids love equipment, and in small groups. If you're going to put out five balls for 25 kids, you're going to lose control of that class because every kid wants to touch the ball. So put out 30 balls because you know that one ball is going to go missing, two balls are going to go missing. Um, enough balls for every single person if you're doing some ball control stuff. Enough scarves. This week I've been doing some catching and throwing. So Having the scarves that are out, um, there are ample um, scarves that are out. So, you know, where the challenge comes in, a child might find that they have already beaten the challenge, so they go and get a, maybe a second item, and they're doing them at the same time, two, two scarves up, um, two hands to catch. Um, so that task one is a critical introduction, and then comes task two. Not long after that, we, we stop, we have a refinement, um, and then we go into a task that is challenging but somewhat unachievable and collaborative and social equipment based small games this is where say a really quick um, small sided game to tie the task one learning uh, might come into play so we, we throw if the task is overhand throw for power then this might be a, um, an opportunity to play a small game there that uh, they're trying to do overarm throw 10 pin bowling um, between with the 10 pin bowling um, in the center and two teams on either end. So it is challenging um, and somewhat un unachievable, which makes our students then hungry for more. We did a, a test last year in student survey. Um, an overwhelming 75 to 80 percent of students in our school actually wanted the task to be really hard rather than super easy. Then they found that they were being a lot challenged a lot more um, in that regard. And finally, then looking at the review of the new content for um, the end, and and kind of we we look at that review with a rock paper scissors. Um, then share. So play rock, paper, scissors with uh, two students. Whoever wins really doesn't matter because then you've made a pair um, and then you're sharing one thing that might have worked really well. Um, and then they move on to somebody else. So they might get around 10, 15 different students about what they're presenting to that. And it's just getting the kids to hear someone else's opinion. So on this, they draw on the www, what went well. They draw on improvements of each other. Um, we can look at student examples and celebrate achievements. Um, Australians love their sport, the and we have a long history of sporting success. But we're at risk of falling behind the world in our health and fitness, because we've turned into a nation of watchers. We watch sport, but not enough of us play it. We move and play less, and it's impacting more than just our waistline. It's impacting our physical literacy. What's physical literacy? It's more than just the physical skills that help us move. It's the knowledge, behaviours and confidence that motivates us to live active lives. Our level of physical literacy impacts how we think and process information, our attitudes, emotions and feelings, and how we interact with others when being physically active. So it's more than just exercise? That's right. Physical literacy is about developing our whole self, not just the physical skills like running, jumping and throwing. Look, most of us know it's important to be active. The real problem is knowing where to start and having the confidence and motivation to maintain an active lifestyle because we know it's good for us. Isn't this message just for lazy people? No, it's for everyone. Increasing your knowledge and physical skills helps you develop the confidence to solve problems and gives you motivation to take action. 
So, what do we do? Start by thinking about what you can do to improve your physical literacy and that of your kids. Help them develop their movement skills like running, jumping, throwing and swimming. Let them play and learn every day. Physical literacy leads to better performance in the classroom, greater motivation and stronger social connections. And it doesn't stop once you finish school. It influences how we incorporate activity at home, at work and socially. By developing physical literacy and making daily physical activity the norm, we can set ourselves and our children up for active, healthy and fulfilling lives. For more information, go to sportoz.gov.au. And that was a great little video from Sport Australia, as I mentioned them earlier. And it really makes us understand that it's not just this year um, or today, this week, this month, this year that matters. It's actually the lifelong um, goals that we're trying to build into students. One of my big domains I look at with our physical literacy is the psychological um, and how that functions uh, with students. And that's one of the reasons I teach values um, in the school is to get students to connect with how they're thinking, how they value themselves, how they see themselves and see others, um, and how they have the right attitude to, and emotions to be able to move forward um, to develop that confidence and motivation that actually sticks. Um, when we look at a classroom teacher, if we go back to that model before that design, a, a classroom teacher will often um, bring a class in, review the content, present the content, collaborate, review findings, cement the findings, but they they fail to recognize that all this can be done through movement. Um, I'm not a classroom teacher, so I know that is there is a hell of a lot that goes on with a classroom um, throughout the day. But finding time probably in each hour to be able to get the kids to move to learn um, is a critical element in that holistic development of a, of a child. I've spoken about our physical education classes um, and looking at how we, we set them up for success. But looking at the combination of the two, we can look at the energizers that exist and being the physical education teachers in the school, being able to move energizers, or you might refer to them as brain breaks, but I don't really ever want the kids to turn their brain off. Um, when it's when it's physical activity, I don't want them to think, oh yeah, I don't have to use my brain here. But the energizer that we can develop um, gives the kids an opportunity to use those in the classroom when they need to, and it helps with that problem solving. So. Um, a great definition of an energizer is that it's a brief activity that is intended to increase energy, referring back to the slide right at the start with the um, the cold and the head and the hot brain. Um, in a group by engaging them in a physical activity, laughter, or in ways to engage the members cognitive cognitively, the problem solving. So again, seeing it as an individual or with your friends as a whole class. It's critically important that our teachers have those. I've got a a huge amount on my YouTube channel, MrHairPhysEd.com. Um, mind you, that is not my YouTube channel. <laughs> That's my web. Um, just YouTube, Mr. Hair Phys Ed. You'll see all the energizers um, that I, I developed there. I actually got very tired from making them last year, so I want to get back into them, but it's just that time and effort. You'll see what I mean. Um, they're not simple to, to put together. They're, they're cartoons that are... Um, that are very engaging for the kids to be able to follow along um, with those and engage themselves, but also learn how to uh, regulate their activity. The next few activities are great examples of what not only we can do in our, in our PE program, but then handball to our classroom teachers. You as the physical educator in your school, are the most qualified person to talk physical activity and physical presence around the school, the physical literacy. Advocate to your principal team. Advocate to anyone in your school that will listen. And here's my greatest tip for you, is that start with anyone that says yes. Anyone that says yes is going to put this together and they're going to go, wow, it made a difference. The maybes are then going to come on board because they don't want to actually take the risk. 
uh, first. They want someone else to go, yeah, it didn't work, or it was a great success. And then the no's, well, you know what? You might not convert them all, but some of the no's are going to come across because they don't want to be left out because everyone else is having a great time. Um, that is my whole philosophy of everything. It's like if you go down to the beach and you start dancing, uh, put on some music and, and have a great time, you're at least going to get one person come and dance with you. And if you get one person to come and dance with you, you're going to get 10 because it's that first person that takes, takes a risk is going to allow others to say, you know what, that's actually fairly comfortable. Um, I can have a go at that. So here's some cool activities from playmeo.com. So I've got this linked right at the end, but playmeo.com has 45. You actually don't have to subscribe if you don't want to. Um, it's well and truly worth it if you do, but you can get 45 activities for nothing. Um, and these are some of my favorite ones. Cat on your head, uh, which is a really engaging silent game that I love playing all the time. It's all about um, sort of almost miming and, and uh, that playful action. Uh, poker head. I love to play this one, not only with cards, um, like, uh, sorry, poker cards, but also with emoji faces. And this is a non-talking one as well that the kids need to find their partners and their matches uh, through moving around the room. And then we had our emoji cards ones where we're, we're discussing and looking at the emojis and needing to create actions that go along with emojis. Um, each of these games also have a ton of variations um, that just help you adapt it. We always, in physical education, I talk about level learning, learning level one being the easiest, level five um, being somewhat harder. Uh, leaving level 10 getting up there and the kids always want to know what that next level is um, and it never finishes because you know sometimes I don't know what that next level is I, I need to see what the level that there is that exists at the moment before I can give them a new level this game I play all the time around the world I use rock paper scissors um, and I get the kids to identify where they want to travel around the world we throw things out um, and we get the kids, they're moving around a large space. So this one creates a lot of movement. Um, this great one, super small, uh, I call this my contagious one. Probably not the right word at the moment, um, but you know, this is my contagious one because we're trying to get everyone in the room to eventually smile, but no one's allowed to smile to start with. Um, which is a really great game for kids to actually concentrate on not being able to smile. The Train Station Greetings, fantastic game. That is, again, a silent game, but a very energetic game. It's the old um, classic, I, I see someone in a distance that I reckon I know, and I start waving frantically at them um, until they get really close to me and I realize it's not them. So what what do I actually do? Because they've, they're looking straight at me. Um, that's one aspect of, of games that re really can change the landscape of a classroom um, and can allow you to review content, to present content, um, walk-in activities, uh, and the classroom teacher can do the same thing. There is no reason why a classroom teacher can't have a walk-in activity. So simple. Um, and then these ones that I absolutely love, Minute to Win It, the concept of Minute to Win It is quick and fast. It's curriculum connected. Um, it's teamwork or individual. It increases heart rate. It's repetition and it's reflective. It gives you so much energy because the kids not only learn that skill straight away, but they've only got a minute to be able to achieve that skill and um, either do it for a set number or see how many they can achieve. For example, jumping jacks, um, you will win the game if you do 60 jumping jacks in one minute. Um, and or, or how many jumping jacks can you do in one minute? I never really at the end asked um, the question of who was the best. I just do a show of hands really quickly, like, okay, who, who jumped one to 10? Yeah, awesome. Who jumped 10 to 20? Oh, well done. Who jumped uh, 20 to 30? Yeah, you guys are great. Who jumped more than 30? Yep. And then one of my best tricks with this is because I know students won't tell me the truth. They always want a big number. I ask them then to start at the number that they got 
and they have to now in the second one count backwards. So if, if someone was honest and they got nine, they start at nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Or if you have um, uh, Miss Molly in the back there, Miss Molly is always trying to be the best in the class, which is fantastic because she oozes confidence. And she says she's jumped 72. She's got to start at number 72 and count back. So it gets kids thinking about um, that honesty side of things. Hey, team. There is a bunch, a bunch. These are all hyperlinked. So there is a bunch of activities that you can go to with these web links. Um, I'm not going to open any of them up because all of a sudden we're going to go to a billion web pages. But be sure to download this on the presentation and then go to those activities. They're already set for you. But as a bit of a teaser, I want to show you this. <laughs> You don't even have to have things that are that creative. These ones I'm going to go through is when last year, uh, when we were allowed to teach, we did a minute to win it. We got the kids to tell me what their favorite activities were, and I drew them up. I had my iPad out, um, the iPad pencil, the big screen going, um, and I drew them as they told me what their favorite activities were. So they think my drawings are hilarious. I think they're quite charming, actually. but. Um, I'll let you guys decide, okay? But we had classic catches, so it's all to do with the catching um, and fielding. Um, we were looking at how many catches in a row. Um, the pretty beautiful person um, who I think is me, I think it says Nat on the back, striking and fielding, so they were seeing how many times that they could hit off a tee and reload. We then had, with a partner, how many times you could catch by throwing into the wall and your partner catching. Um, our next activity was called fielding cones. So two cones on the ground, throwing the ball in through those cones and the other person having to stop it. Um, this is all related to cricket. Um, so if you haven't seen cricket, Google cricket, YouTube cricket, and you'll see sort of what I mean there. An activity that uh, my friend Wayne Schultz made called Crocodile Creek. So a little creek in the middle, having to throw that ball um, into the creek, bounce up to your partner. Um, paddle strike, so that's simply throwing your ball, the ball to your partner, they hitting it, and you then catching it back. Um, we had wickets out, so throwing that ball, how many times can you hit the wickets, and then wall bash, so hitting that ball um, into the wall after your partner has thrown that to you. So that gives you a great example of how we can build this energy into a class, and with the music pumping, with the activities that are engaging, with it being fast, dynamic, skill-related curriculum content uh, hit right there. I mean, the, the, the GLOs that you can hit uh, through all of those activities, not only through the, the fundamental motor skill side of things, but the social and emotional uh, part of our curriculums as well is incredible. Um, I did a presentation similar to this in New York about a month ago, and we had um, upwards of 70 GLOs that we were able to match this presentation to, which was incredible. Now, when we think of physical literacy outcome, I want you to think about your school. 
And where else can we get kids moving? Where else can we get kids energized? Where else can we give kids that physical component, that physical literacy that's going to not only build engagement, but that self-esteem? And we look at before school. Kids are coming to school. So why not promote National Ride to School Days? Why not promote walking school bus? Why not promote um, a you know a green free day where you know parents are not allowed to ride, um, drive their cars to school? Um, why not promote a traffic free area? You know, block off all the roads with your council and not allow cars to come near the school. So that way, people are forced to walk um, and get them moving. Um, at recess time at my school, we have timetabled uh, challenges. So this is my map of my school. I'm so lucky. Um, I've put the graphics over the top because our Google map uh, shows that it's quite dry. But you'll see that the top of the school, have an, I have an athletics track and synthetic field. Um, I've got four playgrounds through the school, which is um, unbelievable. I've got a bunch right in the middle there, a bunch of down ball courts. Um, I've got a large, uh, beautiful, well-maintained football field um, and a big oval. We've got around the school is a running path, but also doubles as a bike path. Um, yes, you ask. Children are allowed to ride their bikes during recess and lunchtime at our school. Um, because up in the top right corner there, or sorry, the bottom right corner on this screen is a BMX track. Um, all of this we're fundraised for because we wanted a very active school. We have the three outdoor basketball courts. We've got one indoor basketball court. Um, those outdoor courts also double as tennis courts um, and so on and so on and so on. So the, the children have timetabled times and challenges that go to each of those um, spaces for them to be active. Um, we can then look at, and this was a great idea that uh, um, Achba, Bernie Holland, has spoke to me about, is uh, lunchtime challenges. So just signs that are randomly up around the school that can change all the time. So we look at how many steps is it from this point to the football goals and back. Um, if you jog for 60 seconds, where do you end up? From this point, walk and talk with a friend. Jump and touch this sign, squat and touch this sign, and then having clubs. So at our school, we have a bike club, we have a dance club, um, we have a running club. We've then got um, music clubs with uh, drum beats. We've got art clubs. We've got Indonesian clubs. We've got um, computer clubs. We've then got our house leaders who run activities for our junior students as well. So we've got ample ample movement around our school which builds that social interaction which builds that psychological confidence that the kids can then bring back into their classrooms um, and then looking at after school so again our clubs work um, in some of our after school programs we've got kids moving back into the community we've got kids walking home we've got the active um, ride to school so ride from home a ride to home, we've got the walking school buses, but then we've also supported with sporting schools from Sport Australia, which provide grants for us to run um, clubs and bring in professionals to cater for after school sport here for our students in Australia. Um, all of these are well and good, but we also need to look at what the outcomes of this presentation is all about. And it is looking directly into one student's eyes, not the school, not a class, not five kids. It's one student. And it's looking at the confidence, competence, motivation, social ability, knowledge of self and knowledge of content um, for that student to live a physically active and able life beyond our care. I don't see them after grade six. That's my problem is that I get to grade six, I boost them all their confidence up, away they go, and then I have to let someone else take charge. So that's where our amplification comes into the, the secondary schools and go um, talk about what the kids are already capable of, what they are able to do, what they're able to um, achieve, and then also pointing the kids into the directions of that um, sporting contact outside of school so they can continue to pursue their boosts of self-confidence, um, their boosts of social ability. In this day and age, that social confidence to be able to work with others is incredibly important as well. Hey, team, 
these are the resources that uh, I have you know, got for you. So the main resources there are from Plameo, from Mike Cooksala, from Learning Readiness PE, which is Paul Zintarski, from Sport Australia, which I've spoken about a lot, Achba Victoria, which is Bernie Holland, um, and then obviously mine. So mrhairphyzed.com um, backslash uh, or forward slash, I think, resources, and you'll find pretty much the last decade worth of work there uh, that I've just put up because I know that if I can help one person, I can help 500 children. I look at things in that um, lens. I was very fortunate a few years ago to go work with the International Cricket Council over there in Dubai to write a book for them, um, which then got downloaded and uh, right around the world with um, the cricket nations. Um, and we reached nearly 30 million children. So I look at those numbers and think I've had that little part to do with that. So please have a look at the, um, the professional websites there. They are just inspirational for everything you need. Um, visit mine. Download this presentation if you want it uh, from that link. It will be a modified version, but it will still look very similar to this. Um, team, remember... Every time you see a child, tell them that they're awesome. Um, this is a bumper sticker that I have on the back of my car so everyone realizes that I'm talking to them. Hey there, you're awesome. Um, and it's so incredibly important that regardless of the achievement from a student, that they know that you care about them um, and how awesome they are uh, to you as well. Um, I've got to thank a uh, big, big shout out to um, these three companies that uh, look after me. So RH Sports, um, NIDA Get Active, which is the NIDA brand of sports at RH, uh, gear at RH Sports. So if you haven't seen RH Sports, jump on, check out their gear. Um, it, it's unreal. I love it to death. It's just so cool. And as a side note to that, um, as a presenter with RH Sports, they are also associated with Brooks Running Shoes. Um, so Brooks Running Shoes also give me all this wonderful gear to be able to teach in, uh, to compete in my Ironmans in, and um, and everything that goes along with that. Uh, it's just super, super awesome to be associated with those brands. Um, above all, you know, if you've listened to this presentation and, and I think that uh, you'll have taken at least one thing away from there, keep in touch. Um, jump on my website there, as I've mentioned earlier, Twitter and Instagram. Um, I don't do Facebook. It's I, I did do Facebook for a long time, but um, I just find that too many socials then take away the valuable time that I'm needed as an educator and as a father um, and then not forgetting then my own goals in life as well. Um, so thank you so much again to Human Kinetics for the wonderful opportunity in presenting uh, this session to you. Everyone out there, stay beautiful. I hope you got at least one thing out of this presentation. And if you have any questions whatsoever, get in contact with me because I love to chat physical education. Be safe out there, be wonderful, and look after those gorgeous kids that you teach because they are awesome.